Okay, first of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Sweden C++ for actually inviting me. Uh, and thank you, King Kong, for hosting us. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about me and the company just in general before we start with the talk. So I work for a company named JetBrains. So uh, I was a developer in the past before I come into the company. I'm not doing actual development of the tools in the company, but uh, I'm more about promoting and talking about the tools. And so that's my job. So as a company in general, we do tools for developers. So that's actually natural that developers are doing different kind of work in the company. We are all developers in JetBrains. So um, we do mostly uh, IDEs and other desktop tools. So these are IntelliJ platform. You may have heard about WebStorm, PyCharm, uh, PHP Storm or IntelliJ IDEA, that is the biggest on IntelliJ platform. Uh, if not, you may have heard about FreeSharper, that is another camp, another platform, that is the extension for Visual Studio developers. Uh, we also do team tools that are TeamCT, UTrack, and AppSource. These are like uh, Issue Tracker, CI Server, and uh, Repository Browser and Code Review tool. And we actually also have our own language called Kotlin uh, that just a couple of days ago was announced as a first class supported languages on Android uh, at Google I.O. So yeah, that's the language that we actually did. <laughs> so we do, as you see, we do many things and they all actually come from our experience. So the way we deal with things is that if we have a problems that we can't solve with the current tools, we just create our own. And then it comes out that some, some other people also need this kind of tools. So that's how the story how all our tools actually have started in the past. So all of them were implemented that way and the language Kotlin as well. So that's not an exception. So, and if we are talking about C-Line, so today I will be mostly demoing the C-Line tool that is a C++ cross-platform IDE uh, from JetBrains. So um, a couple of words about how I will show you the things. So I will be using um, presentation mode, uh, but not always, since it's a little bit better to see for you in the presentation mode what's going on there. But um, I just um, would sometimes will be switching to the normal mode to show you some like windows and menus because they are just hiding the presentation mode. Uh, also, there will be, um, if you see, there will be this uh, thing appearing in the um, mod I'm showing you the actual shortcut I'm using for uh, both Mac OS and actually Windows Linux, the default key map. So uh, just if you want to learn something new and you see some interesting shortcut, there you could find the shortcut for your platform. Um, so that's it about how it will be organized. So um, let's start about C-Line. So C-Line is a cross-platform C++ and C IDE. Uh, actually, it started not that long ago, so we are two years right now. So before that, the story started with the AppCo, that is our tool for iOS and OS X development, mostly for Objective C, but because there are also Objective C++ and then C and C++ came, we realized that we probably could make a C++ IDE, and that's what we did actually. Um, so. Uh, C-Line is a separate tool, so standalone IDE, but you could also find the same C++ support if you're using AppCode for like your Mac development and like Xcode based projects. And the same C++ support could be also found in Android Studio, so if you are doing some Android development and you need some C++, the same language support will be there because that's the same code that we share with Google for Android Studio. Uh, if we're talking about IntelliJ platform in the whole, so some of you may know that most of other tools we have are usually integrated as a separate plugins into IntelliJ IDE. C-Line is not. That's just mostly because we don't have that many resources to implement <laughs> right now. So it definitely will come, but we need to wait for it uh, for a while. I don't know the estimation currently. So. Um, that's more about the introduction. So let's start with the actual tools. So what I have here is just some project opened, but uh, I would like to actually start a new one. Um, that's what I do. So that will be some uh, executable, so I will call it ball game. Uh, you see I got some project generated here. And so 
Now what I'm going to do here, let's go to presentation mode to make it more visible. So I actually would like to inspire you a little bit. And the inspiration will come from the thing that we, the main goal of our tool is to make you more productive with, uh, with the tool. So, and what I would like to do here is I will create some file. So let's start with some basic class. Sorry for some things that are not fitting into the windows properly because I increased the font so that the back rows could see and sometimes it's not very nicely fitted. Um, so, okay, I'll create a new class and okay, here we are. So I have a ball CPP, oh sorry, a ball CPP and all uh, dot h file. So here, um, I will start typing a little bit here, but not too much. Uh, uh, what I need? A label. So you see, it's highlighted in red here, and if I press Alt and Enter simply, I got an import for it. So that works uh, for many many things that you started using but not imported yet. So the IDE just suggests you to import the proper thing. So and now I'm like a little bit tired of typing, so I will start generating things. So first of all, I need a constructor. I guess I'll take all three members. So these are the like. So I could generate it in place or just uh, generate it uh, uh, like I did. So okay, let's do that way. Um, Let's take some getters and setters as well. Let's do that in place. For example, here we are. Uh, what else could I need? Maybe quality operators. Why not? Let's also generate in place. Let's use stdtie, okay? Uh, let's do some more. Some relational operators. Uh, let's not use stdtie, just why not? Um, just to show you some range and stream output operator. Okay, I like it in place as well. So you see what's happening. Like all this code here, all that long was just simply generated in like 10 seconds or how long it took me actually. So I actually only just wrote a couple of members that I have in that class. And all the other things were completely generated for me by the tool. And that's what we like doing, actually. We like generating things and help, like helping you with some kind of a boilerplate code. Because we don't want you actually to write all this code in hands and spend your time on this. We want you to spend your time on some more important things, some general ideas for your code. Um, okay, let's do some other class. I will call it Blinking Ball. And it will be... Ball. Okay, yes, I want ball to be import. So what I got here actually, if we ask C Lion, it will say that base class ball does have a default constructor. And that's actually true. So let's ask C Lion to help us and to import the problem, to solve it for us. I could either create constructor matching base class or create default constructor in class ball. Okay, I'll create a matching constructor. So here we are. Um, so these are the this is the constructor. So uh, okay, what we would like to do now? Let's do some crazy stuff. Let's go here and start. Oh, I made it too burn it. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't have this function yet. So it's in red, that's obvious. But I would like to get it after I actually started using it. I say, okay, create a new function for me. I could uh, turn the name, I could tune some arguments here. I'm fine with what I have. So here I actually got a function. So I just, the thing that I started using something that I don't have currently, and I asked the tool to implement it for me. Because like, I. Well, like how the development process usually goes, you like start implementing your ideas. You don't think about, oh, I don't have this, this function, I need to go somewhere to implement it first. Come on, just kill your idea, then press a couple of alt enters, generate some boilerplate code that you will fill up later. That's fine. That's how we all uh, think usually. 
Uh, okay, so let's do something different here. Uh, okay, let's come on here. Let's do some one more function. Set position, for example, create it for me. Yes, I'm fine with that signature. Uh, what I would like to do now is to uh, what I was thinking about. Uh, okay, so um, let's do something like this. Uh, but remember, I would love to get some. Let it be named. So just to show you. So yeah, I started using some member that's not yet in the class as well. So I could do the same. I could create it. So uh, I got some member. Uh, also, I would like to maybe go here and let's do some stuff interesting here. So I have a color here. I would like to have a color here, but I don't yet have this class. Okay, create a new class for me. So, uh, so I got a class that's called color. So I'll make a you know, class from it. Um, so what I want here is some white. Black, I don't know, red, green. So, um, what about that? So, actually, uh, okay, so some color here. Let's invert it to have it here. So, you see, I could actually create from user, uh, from actual usage uh, members, functions, classes, so whatever I could just start with. So, just Start writing it, and then you will be um, just using it. So something happened to that string. Okay, I don't know what was that. Uh, so I got some things uh, created here. So let's play a little bit more. So with what we get, uh, let's have some other function here. I don't know how we call it. Uh, we call it play. Uh, I would even do some kind of her stuff here I would so let's now I have this function here but what if I would like to have it in the base class actually so that's fine I can do that uh, it's not fitting the screen very well because of the probably because of the presentation mode we'll put it off off where it goes uh, here so um, yeah because the actually this is quite long this is all the refactorings I could um try to apply in this place. And what I actually need is the very bottom of the list. That's why I had to actually uh, um, enter the presentation mode back to the normal one. So I will pull members up, and I will pull this play member to the ball class. Uh, so yeah, what do we have here? This is the ball class, all the stuff that we generated, and we have our play function here. Okay, could it be more complicated properly? So, uh, uh, where is aha? Uh -huh. So we have color here. Let's play with color. So it would be void. Uh, I don't know, like make black. So and it will be doing like is dot c will go into uh, color. What I promised, black. Okay. Um, so, uh, what's that? What was the color? Okay, never mind. So it will be the color. Uh, where was that? Here. So uh, I have a math, uh, a function that is made make black, and so let's try to do the following. Let's try to pull it up to the ball class members up and you see the C now I, I hope you see it from the back rows the C is actually in this dialog is in red why so because we're using it in the actual function that we're going to pull up and so that's not good because that's actually a member of her blinking ball class not the ball where I actually would like to pull this make make black class so that's why it wasn't red so if you just uh, put her 
uh, mouse over here, you see that it's used by make black. So that's what the ID actually find out for us. So if you try to pull something up or down for a hierarchy, it's actually quite important that the ID would suggest to you, hey, don't forget to pull this also, because otherwise you'll get your query incomplete. So, okay, we'll try to pull it up. So yeah, what we have here is we have our red color, and we have somewhere down here, yeah, our make black function. So when you try to pull the things for the hierarchy, so I also try to care a little bit about like the code is still correct for you. Um, okay, let's go to, by the way, I'm just like, I'm trying to go through the, uh, like just click into the class, but that's maybe not a very good thing. Let's try and use some shortcuts. So I could navigate actually to the class file or just something, uh, but uh, just by trying to find it. So like right here, I was using, let me try it again. Yeah, so it was uh, navigation via the class name. So I will go to the ball class. Uh, I wanted to add some functions here. Let's go to the end and I will now add so let me actually make this virtual. I like it. Okay, so um, it will be like that. And I will try another thing that will be float. Uh, I'm running out of some interesting names, so it will be pink, pink ball, okay. Uh, so it will do something and return something, but I'm not gonna think about what it's gonna do and return, so I'll just return zero, but zero. So, but I'm here not for that, I'm here for going to blanking ball class back and trying to show you that if you have something in your uh, base class and you would like actually to uh, override these things, so you could actually see a lot of things here in this dialog, that's the override implement dialog here. I could turn off the all the non-virtual functions just see what I've got, it's also only play. Or I could see the complete list and I could select what I want. So let's start with play. And you see I could, there is this line that insert or write attribute. So that's actually one important thing about it here. Uh, you got it here only if you are using the C++ standard that actually supports this. So if you are coding in C++ 3 or C++, I don't know, 98, and you got a proper standard setup for your project. So the C line will get it and won't show you this fault actually, because it's like not applicable to the older standards. So, okay, let's do some uh, magic here. So we have this uh, blanking ball here. And if we go to the header file, you see that I've got this declaration with override keyword here. So uh, what was there? as well, uh, I think I got uh, some other. Okay, so there was also the pink ball. Okay, let's implement the pink ball as well. So we'll go to pink ball and we'll do some, where was it? Here, the pink ball float. Okay, let's see what we got in the stop. So actually we got the call to the parent function just because it's like, it's a normal function. It's not virtual, like it was, uh, it has some implementation there. Yeah, it's not doing something really smart because it just returned the zero to zero, but that's because that's a presentation in general. So I would like to get a stop with a call to my parent method. And what's what uh, CLine provides you, just shows you the, uh, generates you the stop with some like general call to the uh, base class function. Okay, so uh, summarizing the code generation thing. So what you could do, you could actually generate constructors, destructors, just select the members, what, that you would like to uh, be participating there. You could also actually do some uh, more smart stuff. Uh, let's go to, okay, never mind. Uh, so you could generate constructors and destructors, you could generate setters and getters, uh, you could generate uh, a list of uh, operators. You see it was quite a lot here, uh, quite a lot of things, so uh, they are somehow configurable. So. Uh, generating in place or out of place, using std tie and all the rest. Actually, the operators work in the way that if you still have some operators already written down, you could generate, CLine will check that you have some and will ask if you would like to regenerate them from scratch or just to add the missing ones. So that, that that's also working that way. 
Uh, and you see that uh, you could implement and override all your like functions and move the functions and actually create something from usage. That for me actually the, may be the most nice things for code generation that it could start using something before implementing it. Okay, so that was about uh, code generation. Uh, I will switch back to the normal mode because I would like to see you uh, to show you a couple of windows, uh, and I will do it in a normal mode. So let's talk a little bit about navigation. So we have it was some other project, uh, yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about navigation. So let's go to this class, and you see that I hope you see. Yeah, you should. There, here in the left cutter, there are some signs here. And these are actually signs that helps us to navigate. So uh, you could here, for example, if you click on that uh, left gutter icon, you could see that you could go out the, either to the declaration in the like Lincoln ball class, or you could go to the parent declaration in a ball class here. And it works the other way down, so you could go here as well, and you could find here the pink ball implementation in a uh, like declaration of linking ball, or you could go to the ball class, and here you just jump here. So, okay, uh, here is another thing. Here is just go to declaration definition. You could uh, actually achieve that with just a shortcut, no need to click into some icon. Uh, there is also a, yes, so we don't have this for a account view, but we should have this for a class. No, we don't have this definition. Just, uh, let's try like that. Oh, yeah, so there it works. So uh, if you go to, let's come back to the blinking ball class. So you actually could go for the hierarchy with uh, another shortcut that just go to just goes to super definition. Um, that's and actually these uh, icons in the left cover just do the same for you. Um, what interesting about navigation. So yeah, I also showed you like some shortcuts for uh, going to a class by name. There is also going to a file by name. So I could, for example, go to color.h. And there is also, what, what was that? But, yeah, you could go also to a symbol, like if I type pink, they were pink ball. I could go to some pink ball function as well here. So um, you could navigate declaration, definition, super definition, go through the hierarchy with your, your various ways. You could go to the class symbol or file by its name. What else? Um, you could also actually, so you see that here, let me, uh, let me try to change to the presentation mode, maybe it will be better. Yeah, it would be bigger. So here on the left, I have a project view. So I have like all my files here listed. Um, I could turn here auto scroll to or from source. And that means that, okay, let's take the auto scroll to source. Uh, yeah, so you see that if I click on a file in the project view, it automatically changed me the file in the editor. So it works the uh, all the way around, so for all the actually views here on the left, I will have after scroll to and from source. So, something interesting, sorry, but I, I don't think something interesting here. So, but that's not the only window you could see on the left. The maybe much more interesting would be, let me just take some other class. I think this one would be interesting. So, I could. Uh, change uh, here the view and look at the actual structure view of the class. So it shows me, let me just open it for you here. So it shows me all the things I have and I could, should be, yeah, so it should be working that way, ah, okay. So you just could click into what are you in particular interested in and you'll be navigated to there. You could sort it alphabetically, actually, which is sometimes important because if you have a very long file and you have lots of things happening there, it, there are actually two different types. Sometimes you are interested uh, in the navigation for the structure as it is, in the same order as it placed in your file, but sometimes you are really looking for something and would like just to look it by eyes for some reason, and it's sometimes nice just to sort the file structure alphabetically and just to uh, 
completely completely find it there, so and navigate to there. So that's the structure view. Uh, okay, let's close it to open the bigger files. So uh, what we could try here, we could let's find some call. Go to yeah. So let's let's come here and try to call some uh, hierarchies. So. First of all, let's see the hierarchy of colors. So I could either see the colors or colors, so I could like turn the hierarchy both uh, ways round, and so I could see where my function was called from or what is like called from this function and navigate for this hierarchy. I could also sort it alphabetically or it will be just in the way it uh, shows up in the actual file. I could configure some scopes here as well. So the, that, that actually depends on your needs. Uh, also, I have uh, a type hierarchy. So, yeah, just another shortcut. I will open it for you here. Uh, so yeah, you could also turn it any way around. You could also sort it. You could also uh, select any kind of scope you prefer. That's fine. Uh, but the thing that I'm probably like the most is if I just um, here in the file, I will call the uh, includes hierarchy. So and what I like about it is that actually you could open it up to the things that are not in your project. And that's good, at least like, let's assume that I'm, I'm having some libraries included and I really would like to go for it and to see where, where is it going actually, what is included there. And I could actually do that. So I, I saw some nice uh, projects where I was like doing that, for example, for Qt libraries that I was using, just trying to understand what's going on there. And the libraries are just not in my project, they're just side, li side libraries. And I could also see them in this hierarchy and to see the hierarchy that they are uh, using for it. Includes. So see here, have some string here and other things. Okay, so that was about the hierarchy. So we have, to summarize, we have uh, about the navigation. So we could uh, like go to declaration definition, separate class. Uh, we could go to class, file, or symbol. And we could open call type or import hierarchies. They are available. And you could also open the file structure to see what's going on there. And some more shortcuts that I actually hear are the recent files. So you could actually navigate to the files where you've been recently. That's also quite useful for a big project that if you're working, let's say, on like 10 files in a project, but your project is quite big, and you mostly like navigating among these 10 files, it's quite useful that you have a list of recent files, so you just jump there quickly. And there are also recently edited files, which is sometimes even more important. So like you have a big project, you are like viewing 10 files and you are editing just two of them. And quite easily you could go to recently edited files in a nice shortcut. And here you could also jump to some views like some project favorite or whatever. Um, let's explore them a bit. So favorites are actually the things that you could put some uh, bookmarks in your code. And you could just navigate for these bookmarks. You can assign some uh, toggles. So there are some like 10 shortcuts for the most important bookmarks so that you could use. And there is, you could just build a long list of bookmarks uh, for you for the future here. You can bookmark files. You could bookmark exact clients, whatever. Uh, breakpoints, I will come to debugging a little bit later. Uh, so what, what was also there? Uh, so favorites. Yeah, to-dos, actually. Quite a nice thing. So let me put some to-dos here. So how often do you put to-dos in your code? I actually do quite often. So, and I also do fix me. And actually these two are pre-configured templates, but you can be not limited to these two. You could configure your own. So if you go to settings and go to, to the to-do, and you could also configure any kind of uh, templates you prefer here and they will be also highlighted that way so there is a special highlighting for that so they are not looking like just the commands and there was this nice to do preview that actually shows you let me open it for you this actually shows you uh, all these lines uh, like joined by 
uh, files where they are not, and you can navigate for them. You could also sort them out, and you could also configure the scope and all the usual things. So that's the to-do. And by the way, one very important thing is that if you try to... Uh, that's the project not under VCS, so let me... Let me find another one, just a little under the usual mod. Oh, this project should be under VCS. If you try, I would just want you to show you a commit dialog and this uh, nice thing here that is called check to do. So if you're committing the files, you could uh, put this tick on and the idea will be checking all your to do and fix me for you so that you won't actually commit your code without fixing all these things, and that is good because I actually hate code in the repository that has like, fix me, and then just, what, what is going there? Yeah, sometimes you need that and you could just ignore, but it's nice when like the tool is actually reminding you about such kind of things. So was there something interesting? Let's back to the presentation mode. Uh, structure we got it through, hierarchies. CMake, so uh, it should be a long story here about CMake actually. So uh, the story should start with the thing that CLine is currently using the CMake based project. That's the only project model supported for now. We are gonna like have more, and I guess we'll have like open project from directory and all this stuff. I think, but a little bit later. But CMake for us is not just a built built model, and actually, yeah, you know, it's not actually. It's a nice generator for the uh, build, build models, but as we use it, we use it in quite a smart way. So you uh, might mention already, uh, notice already that while I was adding a file, uh, let me add some class for you here just, just uh, to show what's going on here. I actually need that dialog mostly for you. So uh, you could see here that uh, this is a window uh, with a new C++ class, uh, and it actually suggests me, like apart from the usual things like select an extension which you could configure this list to, or create here only, or whatever, you could actually do this kind of things like add to target. What it does here, it builds the complete list of CMake targets, find a list of targets that are mostly, most likely you are going to add this file to. There is some smart logic work in there, so trying to find out all the targets that are close to the place where you can like create this file. And it actually suggests you to add to targets automatically and it shows you the line what that will be changed. So here it's like the source files uh, variable set and it will just add my test, uh, test cpp and test.h file here to this line. So if I press, so that's just a preview of the CMake file that I'm gonna uh, add this my file uh, my file too, so I will press yes, and if we go to CMake list txt file, you can see here that I got my files added here, and actually these are not the tags for us, these are the references, so if you just go to this file with the usual shortcut that we use like for go to declaration, that will be used to go to this actual file, so uh, the same works for the header file of course. And if you try to rename your file here, uh, I will do something like, uh, like, let's call it do test. I will refactor it. So everything will be refactored inside the files itself. But the most interesting things is that here I got them renamed too. So these lines were uh, also changed. You see that I have this some kind of a banner like reload changes or enable auto reload. What that means is that when you add a new file, you need to reload CMake to got all the changes to apply them. So for big projects, most likely you don't need an automatic reload because it can take ages actually, so CMake could be quite long. So uh, at the project I was like working on before coming to JetBrains, we had a CMake running for 10 minutes. I would never enable it for uh, automatic reload really, and I would always reload uh, manually, but for some smaller projects you could actually get it, so it will uh, still get some smart logic that it won't be in a, like reloading CMake while you are actually typing or doing some changes, but after you finish it will wait for some time and then suggest to reload and if you have auto 
uh, reload enabled, it will just do it for you automatically and get up with all the changes. So here I will, I'm just, that's my maybe it's a habit to do that manually <laughs> after my experience. So anyway, uh, for us, the CMake file is actually a code. So it treats CMake as code, and actually that's what CMake is. That's a code. So you could uh, get some completion here. So you see that it's also working. So you could just, uh, I don't know, whatever you would like to add any comment here. So we, we've got completion for comments and some uh, macros and variables. Uh, so we. Like you, you, you all already seen that uh, Slide is adding files automatically to CMake targets. The same works for, let's try to move that file now. So we'll do save delete refactoring. Yes, I would like to be this files to be deleted. And if we come back here, you see that CMake was also updated. So the files were also deleted from the targets. So you could safely add and delete files and your targets will be updated. In case you got these files, uh, the last uh, files in this line, like you see, I've got quite a lot. If I, will, uh, if I delete all of them, I'll got some notification from the ID that your CMake file may become incorrect because of your change. So please do a check and you need actually to check manually because we don't know what we're gonna do with that. So uh, that was about CMake, and the tool window that I actually was showing to you is just uh, a window that is uh, collecting all the CMake uh, errors here, so you could get all of them here. And so what's, yeah, and there is some reload button, so no, oh yeah, one very interesting button here is actually CMake cache file uh, that you could also open from that tool window and edit or just treat or whatever you want to do with that CMake cache file. So you could add new variables to CMake cache. So that's maybe not a very good CMake style, adding the parameters directly to CMake cache, but sometimes you need that. So, you know, the reality is all, always different from the ideal world. So you could actually edit this file that's just a usual editable file. So go on and do that. And there is some special menu for CMake commands, so you could either reload or you could change project root. So by default, we guess that your project root is this is in the same directory where is the top level CMake list txt file. If that's not the case, just go and change it. And you could also reset cache and reload project. And that's important action because if you would like, so CMake is working that way that while it's reloading, it's usually not uh, uh, regenerating the cache. So to push CMake to regenerate the cache, you actually need to remove it. So if you go to the just ID uh, action that's called invalidate caches and restart, it's different because it's completely removing all the ID caches with indexes, and that's mostly not what you need because you know, like you just build indexes for your project, you're fine with that, but you want to actually recreate CMake cache, and that's the action for it. So we we'll just recreate it, call CMake once again, and reload the whole project for you. So that was about CMake. Let me check what I was planning to show you. Okay, so we'll switch to another project right now. Presentation mode up. Um, let me check. So I don't think I need this anymore. Uh, we'll go here. Uh, I think we can go to presentation mode, should be fine. So, some other smart things that we have. And let's go uh, through them one by one. So uh, I have some project here with some pieces of code that I've prepared. So I won't be coding from scratch, but hopefully we'll be showing some good things to you. So let's start and do some completion at this point. So uh, I have a structure that actually has uh, two int calls and one std string member. So if I just use a usual completion, it will show me all three. But I don't want to use a like a usual completion. What I want to use here is, yeah, what I want to use here is I want to use a smart completion that will filter all the values that I could get here by the type from the left and will show me only the things that I could actually fit here without some typecasting or whatever. And of course, that's only H and ID members that are left. And so here I have only three members and that maybe I could like successfully select the proper one from the usual completion. But if I have a real long list of things going on for your class, and look, 
you could use some uh, standard library things or whatever. They have lots of things in them, and you probably would like to have them sorted out but by what is on your left. So, uh, okay, that was about uh, smart completion. What's there next? Oh uh, yeah, micro completion. So, macroses. Good thing and bad thing. Like we all, like all the C++ now was talking all the previous year about how to, uh, all the previous week about how to deal without them, how to live without them. But they all are coming to the uh, things that we still need them from time to time. Um, so I have a macro here that is uh, some kind of defining a class. And so let's see what I could get out of here. So, yeah, let me do this again. So first of all, I will show you the completion. So you see that the completion actually knows that I have class one and class two defined. So I will select one. And of course, I'll get the method that I got here, that is count one, also the name generated by the macro. So C line actually took all the macro, expanded them, and just understood what's going on there. And I could, yeah, I could try and just see that that's the class definition. So for us, macro is not the text, it's just the full object, and we try to understand what's going on there for you. Okay, so that was some completion thing. Oh yeah, my favorite example. Um, actually, what we do in C line is we, and we do that for every language we have an ID for, and for C++ it was some kind of essential too when we come to the world when we have auto decal types and whatever, uh, some templates, uh, that's actually inferring the type. So C line is inferring the types in the background, and that means that it actually could show it for you. So if I call a quick documentation pop-up here, uh, you could guess that I get actually, let me place it here so that you could see, I could get, uh, I might actually get in a Q variable that is double. And if I change here to integers, I will get it here. So it actually inferred the proper type, uh, and so just show it to me. So yeah. Okay. So what's next? Uh, I'll skip go to fail for a minute. Uh, I'll talk, talk in general first about code analysis. So, the IDE, what it can do for you, except for generating code and inference types, maybe the most important thing that it could actually do for you is to do some static code analysis. So we have different types of static code analysis working in C-Line. So first part is, I'm gonna show it here to you, that's the building code inspections. That means that's, that is the inspections that C-Line is doing on its own and showing them in your code, they're configurable. So if you go to settings, there are inspection settings here. Uh, not fitting this presentation mode quite good, but you could get a, a whole understanding. So it's about 50 or 60 of them. These are the groups. So uh, there are actually four other languages, but we'll talk about that later. So let's see what they can do. So what is here? Oh. So I have this kind of a function and I'm declaring some local variable inside and it actually it conflicts with a parameter and that's what Celine actually shows to me. So okay, I could press on alt enter and try to find a solution and this is called quick fixes. So if you have a problem highlighted in your code, so like it's highlighted while you type it, so you just type it, the ID is highlighting the problem and you could press alt enter and maybe ID could improve it for you. Okay, so what ID could suggest here is reuse previous declaration of parameter name, okay? So it will just remove your declaration and we'll use the parameter. So, okay, another example. Uh, here I have some play function. And if I ask for the warning, I will see that the function play hides a non-virtual function from class ball. That's true, so I have a function in the base class with the same name and signature. Uh, what we can do? We can actually make the base class function virtual. Why not? Okay, it solved the problem. Uh, another thing, uh, so like completely different group of inspections, is about your types and how you use them. So C-Line tried to actually check if your types fit, so if you have like any problems around that. 
And it also checks the format specifiers. So for example here, I somehow just missed the order and just changed them, these parameters. So the, they are not fitting by these format specifiers and so that's what the uh, ID is actually showing to me that for example here, the uh, this specifier requires int, but I'm using uh, char star here, it's not correct. So I could either uh, apply some quick fix or just notice that I actually need to split the variables here. Okay, the most like popular error in that maybe came to us from C language, uh, I don't know, so some inheritance, but we still do that. And that's using quality as a comparison operator. And the ID successfully shows me that actually I'm using equality in conditional expression. And probably that's not what I meant. And most, you, most actually, often that's true. <laughs> that's not what I meant. So, um, okay. And like the last sample here, uh, just the inspection that shows me that the value escapes the local scope. So we're just analyzing the whole scopes and where the variables de is defined. and. We could guess that here you are trying to put something up that's not uh, in, in the scope. So there is actually more. So as I showed you, the whole list. Uh, so there is declaration order. There is like functions, like it checks the non-implemented functions, uh, and some passing arguments to the function that are not correct. It has some duplicate in switch case. I will show it uh, actually later. So some format specifiers that we, we've seen. Uh, equality in conditional ex expression we've also seen, so some other things, some loop conditions that are not updated inside the loop or something. Uh, type checks that was here, uh, so quite a lot of them, like uh, sinus mismatch and other things, value may not fit into receiver, and of course some unused code, lots of things for unused code. But the most important things about unused code and all that stuff is actually the first group that I didn't open intentionally. I'm going to show it right now. That's the data flow analysis. And that's actually smart because data flow analysis, it's like that's the thing that compiler can do because the compiler is just compiling your code and shows you some compiler warning. But data flow analysis is the analysis of how the code, like how the data flows through your code. and Basically, uh, like analyzing that, we could do some and predict some problems here. So that's how we work with that. So let's look at the first example. So and the warning here shows that condition is always true when reached. And that is actually true because if you see at the values that I have previously, X and Y, so you see that what I'm here assigning. So I'm assigning either this pair and then in this case, I don't get to the second condition here where I'm assigning this pair. And that means that that's actually true. So that's what the warning is showing. And that's the complete data flow analysis. So it's taking like the analysis of how the data flows through your X and Y variables and try to guess what's going at this point of the execution. Uh, I promised you some switch case operators. I will do that here, but will then uncomment uh, my version. But anyway, so here I got a default case is not handled. I could create it. I actually won't because I would like my default case uncommented here. Uh, by the way, you see that I'm just commenting the lines in a simple shortcut. There is also a shortcut from, for block commands. So anyway, let's see, I got... Uh, I actually got a color variable C here, and I assigned in the first switch case operator, I assigned red, blue, or green. And let's look at the second switch case. What I've got here is some cases, and this case is grayed out, and that's a reachable code. And that's true, because just on the previous switch case operator, I assigned only red, blue, or green colors. And that's all what I can get. So I couldn't get yellow color at this point. And that's what the ID actually calculates for me and shows it for me. So that's the data flow analysis as it is. Okay. Uh, some also examples of the data flow analysis may be not that interesting. Condition is always false just because we just assigned the another value. But it could happen not just a line above. It could happen like 100 lines above. We never mentioned it. Um, some more tricky example here 
not sure it's quite good, but hope we could fit the most important part. So uh, also two variables, and I'm assigning some values in the switch case operator. And at this point, I got the message that condition is always false when reached. So also because like uh, I could get both minus ones here. So the idea is that uh, what CLIM does here, it actually analyzes how the data flows through the code and try to guess what you could get uh, at that particular point. So sometimes this could, this could be greedy because data flow analysis could be tough, uh, but since you could switch it off if you don't feel that it's doing a good job for you or like taking too much time, it's still working in the background, but if you feel that that's doing some job and using your CPU and your lead, don't need that, just switch it off, but sometimes it's very helpful. And the uh, example that I skipped here, but I want to show you because that was a complete fail for Apple with SSL protocol some time ago. That's called go to fail. I think that you all at least heard about it. So the issue was that that's the actual example that's representing the idea. So what they had, the code, they had double line go to fail. And what that means? That means that all after this, like actually, because this go to fail is not indented that with if we indent it properly, it's actually indented like that. So okay, I will leave it as it was in their code. So what you see here is that the code is unreachable. So, and if you get in the IDE or any other tool that is doing a static analysis for you on the fly, you get this idea completely. Uh, there were a couple of guesses about how these error actually were introduced to the code, and I would like to address these guesses a little bit because, first of all, if you actually type in the code in C line, you would never get this line, the second go to fail, indented like it is because the ID is actually doing the auto formatting for you automatically. And if we stop at it uh, at this point for a while and look to the settings, so okay, they're maybe not looking that good in the presentation mode, but you could get still the idea. Let me, okay, so let's switch to the usual mode to show you the whole window. So here we are. Uh, the idea is that there are lots of settings here, so you could configure spaces, you could configure raping and braces, you could configure blank lines, whatever. You've got a preview on the right, so if you change something in the settings, before clicking apply or OK, you could see the highlighting change here in the right, just at least to guess what the settings is actually doing. So you could also save some uh, default schemes uh, and what is maybe more interesting, you could actually set uh, some predefined shim from some like, popular one. For us, it's currently Google, Allo, VML, DB, Qt, GNU, Straustrup, and some braces styles like Almond, Whitesmith, and uh, Cardigan Richard braces. So these are the settings that are saved under these names. You could build your own style shim on top of that. Then you could export it, share it with your team member, for example, in VCS, so you could, so there are actually two ways of sharing with the team. You could either export it, uh, like as a code style settings, then just give it to your team member and this team member will import, or you could just put the proper file to the version control system and it will be checked out with the whole project for you. So uh, there are lots of settings, uh, not only for C++, there are actually even CMake settings, so some of them at least, so that could help you to configure um, how you write actually the, um, how you write the CMake files. Uh, that's actually, this one is maybe very popular, that is for its common case, because sometimes CMake files are written in capitals, and you would like, like for example, in completion or in other places, these capitals to be forced, so you could configure it here. Uh, okay, so let's come back to the actual example, it was here. Uh, so yeah, so if we like type it properly, the auto formatting will work, and I would never go to, will never come to this line indented here. The second thing is that there is actual decode analysis, and so if I, uh, oh, I will still take this off. Uh, let's come to commit dialog again and see what I got here. 
actually I here have the performed code analysis things. I could actually perform code analysis on the computing stage. So while I'm talking about this, so the guess was that the problem could be introduced during merge. Because on merge they could get these two lines because they are very like they are just the same lines and uh, this could be possible that they just got them uh, while merging some things in the files. So if you do some merge, you could introduce some problems. And Celine actually could run the static analysis on your commit stage. So you just merge and then run in the code analysis and see if you got any kind of problems with your merge. So, okay, we'll close the commit message for now. So that was about go to fail. Um, what's next? Yeah, let's do some refactorings. Finally, we came to them. So let's refactor something. So before I just show you how you could uh, pull members up and down for the hierarchy, but you could actually do more. So uh, let's see if it fits here. OK. So we'll do some extract. So you could extract variable. You could extract constant. You can extract parameter, define, type def, function, separate class or subclass, whatever. So let's do some things here. Oh, sorry. Let's do some variable, for example. So what I even suggest, uh, actually Silan suggests me here, is to replace this occurrence or all four of them. Uh, and, oh, yeah, they are fitting more or less. So you see that I have more usages of uh, this expression somewhere like down here and they are uh, on top. So actually there are four of them and I will change all of them. So we'll call it delta. So uh, here I have, yeah, you could see it, but maybe not very good because it, actually my color is gray. So that's your color on the projector. That's white. But, I could see it actually better. So that's uh, Windows actually suggesting me pop up, suggesting me to declare auto or declare cons. So I could actually select both, and it will be this um, delta variable here that is const auto, and it was replaced everywhere. So you could see here uh, as well. So all four occurrences were replaced. Um, I could also try to do the same for this, but I will extract it. Parameter. Uh, yeah, let's try to replace all four occurrences. So you see I have uh, lots of expressions using this part, so I'm going to replace all four. Uh, let's, um, I don't know what, what was that, but let's call it parameter. Uh, I could also declare it as in cost, but I will leave it as it is. So I get this kind of... Uh, Kind of value here. Uh, what else I wanted to show you? Aha, uh -huh. yeah. So here I have a kind of a function. So let's do two actions. So first of all, I will try to. Uh, doesn't fit. I need one in the very bottom. Okay, so yeah, here it is actually in line. So yes, I would like to inline one usage. I'll do that. And what's the contour action, opposite action for inline is actually extract function. So I'll do it back. So extracting the function, I could change the signature. I could uh, like uh, tune the return type. I can tune the name. So yeah. And here we are. So we have this kind of function here at the bottom. So let's look at the no, let's look at the refactoring window a little bit more. So that was about extract. So you could extract many things you see here. Um, superclass subclass actually works the same smart way as pull members up and down. So if you select a couple of members that you would like to extract your subclass, uh, like for a superclass, for example and you have some uh, methods that are related to them or something that is using these members or whatever, uh, these related members will also be highlighted in red as for the same as I showed for pull members up, so you will never miss a member. Uh, 
Okay, let's uh, hopefully we could leave with presentation mode now. So let's do change signature. So change signature. So let's have this kind of a call person here. I will change signature and I will actually add one more person data reference. Let's call it two refactor. So we see what I've got here. So first of all, I have my signature changed here. So a parameter was added. Second, I've got some kind of a stop here to add. I will do some null PTR here. Ah, oh, it was a reference, not a good thing to do. But okay, let me, uh, I wanted to show you how you could get an error. So I'll change this to pointers to be more creepy with the example. So I've got an output here here. What, why I wanted actually pointers here is one thing. I will now go to change signature again. And what I can do with a change signature, I could change the order of the parameters. And that's kind of a dangerous because I could get an error. But would I really? So let's change, see what I get in the usage. The actual call was also updated. So the parameters actually changed the order. Because if I don't, I'll got this null PTR instead of uh, like my first parameter and I could get a problem if I'm actually getting something there. So the idea is that change signature try to, tries to update all the usages as well. So either with some steps, uh, parameters, we are actually thinking right now that maybe we would add some ability to add some default values right in the dialog. This could probably be a nice feature in the future. Uh, and it also tries to update all the usages accordingly to your change so that you don't get to some kind of an incorrect code in the end. Okay, so that was refactoring. So you see that we've got lots of them. Uh, let's try something different. Yeah, Doxygen. Doxygen is actually a nice way to document your code. That's more or less a standard. So maybe like um, some other th standards will come, but still most of the code right now has, uh, I guess, has Doxygen on board. So what we have here for Doxygen, so first of all, we could get a preview. So without any kind of Doxygen generation, so we do not call the Doxygen common here. So what we have is we actually just take the Doxygen styled commands and just build a kind of a preview with uh, all the things uh, that you could get finally in the Doxygen documentation. So you see that uh, it was previously like, I'll show it once more. So here it was the uh, command per line for each uh, parameter of the function. And so I got it all joined in one window. That is like the same documentation window that I showed you while we were inferring types or looking at the macro. So uh, we actually could do a lot in the quick documentation pop-up. So we show the infer type, we show the macro substitution if you would like to get what's there in the end of the macro. And we also show the oxygen documentation. So, but that's not it. So for us, the commands in oxygen are also somehow like a code. And that means that I could actually try and generate something here. Oh, and that's what I got actually. So I could now type some um, description. That's actually configurable. I could configure C line to generate brief tag here. That is somehow mostly used for some kind of description. And then uh, tap some description here. Here I have a variable uh, named val, and you could see that the highlighting actually highlights the variable in signature. And that's uh, like that's intentional. Oh, I call something else. So that's intentional because if I would like to rename it to, for example, my value, the doxygen command will be updated accordingly. So these are the references, these are not the text. So if you like update, it will be updated as well. Uh, again, we have some smart feature in our mind for the future that maybe if changing the signature will also do some kind of update to the doxygen command. It's not yet there, but we are thinking about it, probably will add it. So yeah, you can actually, to summarize the doxygen, you could preview, you could generate stops, and you could actually update, you could change signature, update your signature of your function, and get the oxygen commands updated accordingly. So, okay. Um, that's it with that project. 
Welcome to another one to show you unit testing. Uh, so where was it? Oh, I closed it, I guess. So let me find the project. Just a second, I'll open the proper project and we'll show some unit testing to you on it. Okay, good. Ah, here is it. Um, yeah, so uh, for C line, we got uh, Google Test and Catch on board. Uh, sorry, nothing for mocking frameworks, <laughs> uh, at least not yet. Um, so uh, we could may maybe do more in the future. But what we have for now is actually uh, the the most important thing for unit testing is actually uh, a building test runner. So if you have, for Google test, if you have uh, your CMake project with some Google test targets that are linking with gtest on G or gmob, uh, we'll create a proper Google test configuration for, uh, for you automatically. So if, uh, but still if you want, you could create them uh, actual manually. So I will like write, run all in, this picture. Um, let's do some run and I'll show you the. Let's try to switch to the presentation mode if it's better somehow. So, yeah, here it is. So, this is the build in test runner. So, what it shows you, it shows you all the tests you've got. Um, so, it shows you all the like output in case that it's important if you test fail actually to see the actual output. You could navigate to the code from the test and you could also rerun all the failed tests. So it doesn't matter how many of them you get, but you could just simply rerun them by like, pressing one button. You could also sort the test uh, alphabetically or by the duration, which uh, could be important if you would like to see what's happening in the, for example, longest test for you or why actually it's the longest one. So uh, the same thing works for catch. So uh, the only thing that you have to do is to configure like a C line run debug configuration manually. So we, because we can't actually detect catch in any way automatically for you. So uh, this is the, the build and test runner. The, also the nice thing is actually the test generation. So if I call uh, generate common here, you can see that I get uh, I got two new members that is test and test feature. So if I start test here and it will be calendar fixture. Okay, uh, I'll let some I don't know, example test. And you see that the macro was actually changed because that's that's now the test uh, F marker that is a proper one here. So this line is just adjusting my test marker to the proper one from the Google test automatically, just looking at what I've actually written here. So you could generate tests and you could uh, run them with the built-in test runner, and that's it for unit testing support. Okay, so uh, let's now go to to some debugging here. So I have the project here. I will uh, run the main target. Okay, so this is calendar run. Oh, I want it to debug it actually. Let's debug it. Okay, calendar run. So I had, uh, so some input here. So here is, what's the day to do? I don't know, like, okay, never mind. So I got a breakpoint set in the code here on this line, and I could actually inspect the state, but that's that's usual, that's what we get with uh, more or less uh, average debugger. But what's most important here is that you see this kind of a great text here. That's not commands, that just appeared while I started the debugger. And that's called the inline variables view. And it actually shows you the actual value of the variables at this stage, this step of your debugging process, just in the editor. So you don't need to do some kind of a hover on your variable to see some value, or you don't need to go to variables uh, tool window in the debugger tool window. You don't need any of this. You could just see the values in the editor. 
And if I right now try and change the value, let's go to the future. Uh, you see that it was updated here and it was actually highlighted because it was changed manually. So you could see what's going on there in your code. So we have breakpoints, we have this kind of a variables view. There is, of course, some uh, evaluate expressions. So a plus month, for example, evaluate. So I could evaluate, I could uh, add it to the watchers later if I want to see how it goes in the process of uh, my debugging. So I could also just we do support, so this is just a front end for the debugger. We use GDB or LDB, and you could select between them. And actually, uh, you could go and just type a comment in the GDB or LDB console if you're just not satisfied with what you've got in the UI. So that's pretty simple. Uh, we also have uh, these things that is called uh, attached to local process, so if you just don't want to start a process from an ID, you just start it somewhere, in some way, uh, and then just attach it to the process using the process ID or the process name. Uh, just search for the uh, list that is showing in the window. So, and there is also remote debug for GDB. It works uh, with the GDB remote server. So if you just start your target remotely under the GDB server, then you could create a special debug, remote debug configuration and set all the proper parameters. So I could uh, try and show this. Do I have remote debug configuration? No, okay, let's just create one. So to show you what you've, so that's the usual parameters that you are usually configuring for GDB servers. So that's just the arguments, that's some symbol files, some syswords, some path mappings if you need some. So uh, you just configure this and run this configuration and just connects remotely. Uh, it works quite fine. And since we have the built-in terminal window, so here's it. Uh, since we have the built-in terminal window, you could actually connect to your remote host and st start it right, right from the ID. No need to. Um, no need to actually do this some kind of, from some other terminal. So um, let me stop here. I wanted to. Um, ah, okay, so let me show this again because I wanted to show you one more thing for debugger as well. So, what I wanted to debug this target. Uh, I need some values, but it doesn't matter which one. So I will run to this line by running to cursor and when stopping to it, and what I get here is actually the disassemble view. So it currently works uh, only when you stop in something that you don't have the source code for. We are going to implement the disassemble on demand that will stop into anything you really would like to. And so we'll just be just be more controlled by you. So currently it just uh, jumps into the disassemble code when you don't have the sources. So you could just continue your debug for this code, just step through your code and see what's going on there. Uh, okay, so that was for debug. Where is my file here? So, uh, so yeah, summarizing the debug. So there are like uh, breakpoints, set values, evaluate expressions, and stepping. That is quite usual. There is inline variables view. There is attached to local process. There is debug remotely, and there is the disassemble view. So, uh, what else do we have? So I already showed you the uh, like what I wanted here. Let's check the two windows. So I showed you the terminal window, CMake window I also showed you. Let's talk a little bit about version control systems. So I was showing you the commit dialog previously, but let's see what we also have here. So these are the version control systems uh, that are here by default. There's GitHub, CVS, Git, Mercurial, Subversion, and TFS. There is also Perforce plugin that can be installed from the repository. So there is uh, like the built-in support for all of them. And what we provide is a common interface. So all the like commit changes or date project out, they look the same, whatever uh, version control system you use. But we also have some uh, more customized menu depending on which uh, actual version control system you are using. So here is the 
uh, GitHub project, so I have some Git menu here. Uh, there is actually the tool window for version control. Uh, it shows uh, like some block, and you could see how some branches were merging here, what, what was actually happening here. You could look for it, you could search for it. Uh, there is some regex and match cases settings available for the search, so you could actually do quite a lot. You could tune the how this tree looks like, so configuring some options like showing some tag names or trying to use some more compact preference view. Um, there is also, uh, yeah, so you could uh, check some branches, whatever you have. And while starting the project, you could actually check out from any version control. So, for example, if you're starting with a GitHub project, it's quite straightforward. You just do check out from version control, select GitHub. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit collapsed so because of the view, but still you just pass the link to the GitHub project here, and it just check out it completely for you. And if the project has the CMake build system, it actually finds it and asks you if you would like your project to be open immediately, you just press yes, and here you are done with the project uh, in your IDE. And if you are using Chrome browser, there is a plugin for Chrome browser that allows you to install this nice C line button. So like if you install the plugin, you would actually see this button if you got a C++ project with CMake project model. Uh, on GitHub, you will immediately see this icon, you could press it, and it will just check out the project for you and open it since you're in your instance of the C line. So very easy and very straightforward. Uh, so yeah, um, there are actually other version control plugins available in the plugin repository. So like we have the open API, so people do things, and the repository uh, with the plugins is actually quite big. So um, I could actually just a little bit show what we got. So if you go to plugin settings, so these are the things that we've got up on board. So by default, we have like C and C++ support. There is also web support, like HTML, JavaScript, like all the CSS things, they are just bundled. So you could start with them quite easily. There is PyCharm Community Edition plugin. That's a total equivalent for PyCharm Community IDE. So you've got some Python scripting uh, things on board. So there is also coming with like highlighting, refactoring, code analysis. So you'll get it for your Python code if you have it in the project. There is remote host access that works like we do not support remote projects completely right now, so we can't like uh, use the project that is somewhere remotely. We need your sources locally, but with remote has, uh, has it's a little bit easier because you can configure SFTP or FTP uh, connection, and it will be just uh, checking out the sources and synchronizing them automatically with your local machine, and you could just work, and your sources will be synchronized later to your remote host. And so if you're, for example, working remotely, you could do this way, like go this way, synchronize your sources, and then if you would like to debug remotely, you could use the remote debug feature. So remote run and remote project opening is not yet supported, but it's in our plans. I guess we'll have it uh, sooner or later. So there is also like, yeah, there is a Swift plugin that I have here installed. It's not installed by default, I guess. It's because I actually installed it. But so we have the Swift support in AppCode that was like natural for IOCD. But since the Swift has arrived to Linux, we decided to make a plugin for CLine as well. So if you would like to play, play with a Swift language on Linux, you could use CLine as a full feature ID. So it will be like code highlighting and the refactoring that we currently have for Swift, and it's renamed, it's introduced a create type from, from usage. There is override implement, so you could use these things uh, with the Swift plugin here as well. So, yeah, some other plugins, some other languages. There is, uh, as far as I know, there is a plugin for Lua in the community. It's not written by us, it's written by some other person and it's more or less working. I'm not, not sure about how functional it is. It's not done by us. So, but I could also uh, press browse repositories here. Let's try to enlarge the window to show the details. So that's the whole repository that's actually located on the plugins.brains.com and you could select an ID there and to see the whole list to browse for it. But you could also browse it from the ID. So 
There are actually dozens of plugins here uh, created uh, by the community. So mostly it's not the plugins maybe from JetPrint or from some other people. Some of them are quite nice and functional. So actually there are lots of them. Uh, I'm actually like right here like showing you shortcuts with the plugin uh, implemented by one of our colleagues that's called Presentation Assistant. And that's the plugin that's actually showing you the shortcuts while I'm typing. So uh, yeah, that's it about the plugin repository. Um, what else? Yeah, let me just show a little bit about tuning your IDE because this could be also important. So I could uh, change the like the color scheme so it could be different things. There are lots of things here. Uh, I prefer just default and sometimes switch to dark color. So, but there are lots of them and like you could select. Um, there is also like oh, some hot style sheet that I created to many of them. Uh, there are key maps that is maybe more important. So with the key map, that's a story that if you like got used to one, it's very difficult for you sometimes to switch to another one. And for example, if you were using some other ID, for example, Emacs, or you got used to something else, and you would like to use the shortcuts in your current ID, you could do that actually, just switch the key map. And there is also an ID of Vim plugin, so if you are a fan of Vim binding and you know how to quit Vim, then you could install the plugin. Uh, and uh, you could actually try the ID of Vim bindings here as well. So, uh, yeah, so some, and you could switch in general between default and uh, dark color mode here. So. That's about it. Yeah, and it, talking about the key map, by the way, so the key map are actually not limited to what you've seen in that menu. So you could actually select any of it and then configure it for yourself. So just change some shortcuts. That's not fitting in presentation mode, so let me show it in the usual one. So, so my comment. Let's yeah, so, so I just want to show you some shortcuts. So you could actually click in any action that you see here and tune the shortcut. You could look by the action. You could search by actual shortcut. So you could just go here and try to uh, search some shortcut and we'll show you the action which actually uses these shortcuts. If you like, for example, feel that you may have some conflicts with your customized shortcuts in the system, just go and find it here and change it. And then you can also save it and share with the team. So that's the same story as with the code styles. So that's about the key maps. Uh, what else have I missed? Okay, let's assume that I didn't miss anything. So, and we'll just come to your questions. That will be easier. So yeah, just feel free to ask whatever you want. Yeah, so we have a mic. So I think. Okay, so, okay. Hi. I think we, we better use it for the recording. Yeah. Uh, okay. So my first question is like, uh, how many questions can I ask? <laughs> as many as you no, want. I see. But if they will just uh, push us from where here, we can okay. do this somewhere else. <laughs> so my, f I mean, uh, so I can ask like. Three questions, and then okay. uh, my first question is: Is, is there any like the performance overhead? Uh, so, yeah, good question. Actually, about performance, let's talk and, about. And uh, especially about find usage, because you have a method, I guess. Yeah, we have. Okay. Version of this in Visual Studio, and then you have a find usage method for C++, which is not, I mean, as good as what we have in C sharp. Okay. And I just want, I just wondering why. And my uh, next question is. Uh, uh, you mentioned something about uh, Google and Android okay. in the beginning. So yeah. are you talking about like any supports for NDK or like what okay, types let of me features? Try, let me try and address it by one. Okay. Let's start with the performance. Yeah. So since it's C++, the performance doesn't depend on the number of lines of code you have. That, for C++, it doesn't matter. You know, you could have a very big project with just a very simple code and it works fine. But you could just include Boost and do some more crazy things. And that got lots of code that actually we need to parse. 
because the Siva actually try to tries to understand what is written actually in the code, and you see because it does quite a lot of smart things, and to do these smart things, it actually needs to parse all the includes you have to do all the stuff to understand all your code, and like. I was just talking about these actual things just uh, previously a week before it's plus plus now and a little bit earlier at ACCU that with C plus plus it's somehow difficult for parsing because that's maybe the trickiest language for parsing because to parse C plus plus you actually at the very uh, point you are parsing you need to understand if that's a type or not and that's difficult because for C plus plus it's not always like. Uh, easy to understand. You need to actually resolve the code to get this knowledge. And that means that to parse the code, we need to resolve it. And that also means that even to highlight the code properly, to format it properly, we need to resolve it, because you can't format C++ in Lexer. You just simply can't. Uh, like, that means that we need to do a lot of work in the background. That could lead to some performance degradation if you have a very big and, like, let me say, Hard, heavy templated code with lots of things included, lots of big libraries. It could take time, but here we are like in a better situation than, for example, uh, our extension for Visual Studio that is with Sharper. But we could, as it's completely our tool, it's a standalone ID. We could increase the memory that is uh, given to the Java process because this whole thing is written in Java. So we are like running the Java process, and if we set the value, so the default value is two gigabytes of RAM, but if we increase it, so for example, to open LLVM project with the whole things included, I usually use uh, like four gigabytes reservation. It uses something, something about three and something, I guess, in average. So, but that's enough. But if I use the default, I'm not fitting into memory. I got some like, problems, performance degradation, that's for sure. So with the performance, that's the question like, I could give you, can't give you an estimation like well, this product fits and it doesn't. So first of all, you need to try. Second, if you see that there are some kind of a problems, you could go to uh, this kind of settings, appearance and behavior appearance, and there is this show memory indicator. You could switch it on and it will appear in the uh, left, uh, right bottom corner. And it will show you uh, the actual usage of the memory by the tool. If you see that it's quite close to the limit, just go to the settings and increase it. Uh, like, that's the general story. So, in general, we do tasks with some big projects. Some of them are doing really good. Some of them, like Chromium, is not doing very good. Uh, like, we are working on it. That's the story about the performance. So the second question was about fine usage. Of course, we have it. I didn't show it. I don't know. Why. <laughs> uh, so what's the best place to, to try it here? So we could do it actually here. So yeah, fine usage is just the usual shortcut, and it will find you all the usages, and you could see them sorted by value read, value write, so sort it some other way to see what's going on. And of course, that's not the text usage, just by the context usages. So if you have some variables with the same name, it will be looking for your proper context usage, but not the text. So yeah, it works, that's the usual way. And the third question was about Android. So yeah, the story is that there is open source tool called Android Studio. That is based on our IntelliJ platform that is also open source. The only piece of code in Android Studio that is not open source, that's actually the C++ support that is coming from c -Line. So if you use Android Studio, you can use it absolutely for free with your C++ code, but only for Android project. So in Android Studio, you've got some uh, cross-language resolve between Java code and C++ calls. Uh, and uh, there is some like NDK support and whatever, but that's on the Android Studio. They are not reporting this back to C line. So you have some Android support in the IntelliJ idea, like if you are doing some kind of Java or a Kotlin code for Android, you I guess you have uh, lots of Android features there. They are doing that, but for C++ code or NDK support or whatever, this not coming back to C line. And we are like a little bit undecided if we need to have it on board because there is a nice tool, Android Studio, also based on our platform. And so if you do Android development, you can just take it for free and use it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh.
welcome. Okay, who is next? Yeah, I think over there. Yeah, yeah, in the center. Uh, you talked a bit about uh, formatting tools. Can you make that respect the uh, Clang format file? Uh, so we currently don't work with Clang format. We think about uh, making some kind of an import export from Clang format to our format, or maybe bundling the Clang format. We're a little bit undecided. We actually we started working with the Clang tools, so uh, I didn't show it to you, but we have a Clang tidy bundled in the latest uh, Earl Access preview. So it just shows you the same warnings as I showed you with the bundles inspections. It shows you just the Clang tidy warnings. And you could choose, like, choose, for example, like, I don't know, C++ core guidelines or modernized checks and uh, see them in your ID and apply the quick fixes. So that's the, like, maybe the first Clang tool we actually bundled. So we do consider doing these for like Clang format. We are a little bit undecided either to bundle it completely or to make some export import. It has a little bit different set of settings in comparison to ours. So we still need to check if we could to translate one to one completely. Uh, but maybe we we actually thinking about that. So it's not yet there. How about that? Thank you. What kind of support do you have for pair programming, ad hoc code reviews, teamwork? Can I share my display or maybe parts of my code with someone else also using C Lion and Network? So uh, we have a very nice tool for code reviews and it's called AppSource. Uh, it was introduced, I guess, a year or a couple of years ago already. So uh, it works like you could just open your code in browser and then like browse with the app source. Uh, you could also install an app source plugin into C line. So and if you are doing like a code reviews with your team, so you will see some commands appearing and attached to lines of code in this plugin. So you could do some kind of stuff like that and you could re actually review the code with the actual tool. So it's not uh, like some kind of a version control system or something. It's just a tool for code review, and it has a plugin that is supported in uh, all our IDs and in, like ontology based tools. So uh, yeah, you could like do these kind of things with App Source. I think it fits all your questions in some sense. So there is also an ability to do code reviews without actual tool, which is actually nice. You could just review the code. In browser go into app source service um, it's a little bit more smarter for the languages like Kotlin on Java like we started with them but I hope this kind of smartness will come to C++ as well because for Java and Kotlin you not only could uh, review your code but you could also see the Java code inspections like in Intelligent IDEA but on app source for C++ it's not yet done but I guess it will be done somehow in the future, but still you could just review the code, it will be like, highlighted and you will write some commands and uh, provide some code reviews, ask questions to your colleagues, resolve some questions, so whatever, just the usual things you do with the code review. Can two people edit the same code at the same time? Uh, if we talk about this kind of collaboration editing, so yeah. Uh, I don't think we have something for that, like so that it will appear immediately. Uh, I no, I don't think we have something. So you need at least to commit it. Okay, someone else. You are some more hands. Does this work? Okay, we will. Can I ask you to make this question direct to Anastasia and go to her? Because we need to be a little bit late now, and we need to um, probably eat lunch, find us. So if you have questions, additional questions, please come. Yeah, so you could just come and we just continue in person, the other people will just move I'm, I'm a little bit <laughs> sorry for this, but we're a little bit late. 
It says also enough from my request to speakers. Sometimes people say, yeah, we talk about I'm not professional enough. <laughs> Let's look at me. I have slow papers on the ground. I need to interrupt now. But this is how it is. No problem. Thanks, Anastasia, for yeah, this great thank talk. You. Thank you for having me. Is that if you have a question, you can ask me.